present that through Jesus we have these gifts every single moment of every single day. And the this Sunday is the second candle is lit. We turn our eyes to peace and to the peace of Christ. And there's a devotional that's in your um, bulletin that we would ask that you just be thinking of peace this week. And let us pray now for the Advent gift of peace to be felt in our midst. Father, I thank you that when the angel came and spoke to the shepherds, he said, peace on earth and goodwill to men. And Father, we thank you for peace being here through Jesus right now. And Lord, we even know from the teachings of Jesus that peace does not mean that there is no hardship. And peace does not mean that there is no pain. And peace does not mean that there is no suffering. But that you, peace, wonderful counselor, prince of peace, are with us in every single moment. And God, as you have given us the gift of peace, I pray that we would not listen to our culture and society to define what peace is, but that we would look in turn to Jesus, to your word, and find the real meaning of peace. And Father, as we set our face upon you, Jesus, we would know peace that passes all understanding. And Father, I thank you, and we pray this day from 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every situation. May the Lord be with us all. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Several decades ago, there was a radio personality by the name of Paul Harvey who was made famous by his taglines regarding the rest of the story. Take, for example, the story that he told of a scrawny 13-year-old boy growing up before the Great Depression who was nicknamed Skinny. Skinny was not like the other kids. He kind of kept to himself, read a lot of books, and was often teased and bullied by the other children. So instead, Skinny would spend his days at the local fire station. He would bring along his favorite companion, his Airedale dog, who would stay at the firehouse while Skinny was at school until the boy came home from school. One day, Skinny came to the fire station, and a firefighter noticed that his lip had been busted, that his eye was blackened, that there were dried tears on his face. So he asked Skinny what had happened. Skinny proceeded to tell him that this time he was unable to outrun the bully who did this to him. And with that, Skinny began to cry. The firefighter told Skinny, you happen to be in good company because I used to be a boxer. And he invited Skinny back to the firehouse for some lessons. Well, several lessons later, the bully once again caught up to Skinny, but this time, Skinny turned around and stood his ground. The two boys scrapped it out to a draw, earning Skinny the respect of all his classmates. No longer would he be taunted with the words, little girl, because of his first name, Marion. In addition, Skinny earned a new name from the firefighters at the station. They figured you can't call a fighter like this skinny and it just so happened that the air dog Dale that followed his master was named Little Duke so they decided that they from there on would call him Big Duke 
Big Duke. That name would stick with this little boy throughout his adult life, and that skinny, scrawny boy named Marion Michael Morrison would become the big two-fisted legend on the screen that we know as John Wayne. And in a voice that only Paul Harvey has, that unique one-of-a-kind uh, voice, he would end this tale with these words, only now you know the rest of the story. As we take a look at Christmas during this Advent series, Titus according to Christmas, uh, Christmas according to Titus, we can look at Christmas as a story that has a rest of the story. Last week, as we opened our Bibles to Titus chapter 2, we looked at verse 11 that says that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And certainly we can see how that verse connects to the very first Christmas when uh, angels appeared to shepherds and announced that a Savior had appeared to them, that when those angels said to the shepherds, for unto you... Has been born a savior who is Christ the Lord. He was essentially reiterating what what Paul would later write to Titus about the grace of God appearing and bringing salvation to all people. But there's a rest of the story that is often not thought of as part of Christmas, as part of why the grace of God came, why the salvation of God has come that Titus continues in chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. Today I want to speak on Christmas, the rest of the story, and invite you once again to turn in your Bible to Titus chapter 2 as we look at verses 11 through 15. And again, I want to remind you this Advent season is part of your preparation to celebrate our Lord and Savior who was born for us Memorize Titus 2, 11 to 15, because in it, he, he takes everything that Jesus was about and compacts it into just several verses. And I feel like over these weeks, as we're looking at Titus 2, it's almost like we're opening up this Christmas gift. We're removing the wrappings of this Christmas gift of Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. Let's look at it again. He writes, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Now what we're going to focus on today is combining and looking at verse 12 in conjunction with verse 11. And I'm going to boil verse 12 down to two primary statements. And the first one is that that grace of God that appeared in verse 11, that salvation that has come in verse 11 that we celebrate through the birth of our Savior is a gift from God. We saw last night that grace and gift are interchangeable terms. God's gift enables us, first of all, to say no to the life that we no longer want, and God's gift enables us to say yes to the life that we truly want. I want you to look at verses 11 and 12 again. And I want you to notice how verse 12 is a continuation of verse 11. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, 
training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You will notice that in the English language, there is no period there. There is just one continuous sentence with clauses, with phrases that are separated by, by commas. And the same thing is true, by the way, in the original language. In fact, the original language does, doesn't have commas, so it just looks like one long, big sentence. So I want you to see how when he describes God's salvation coming, when he describes the grace of God coming, as we look at verse 12, that it trains us to renounce ungodliness. It's not so much that Titus is saying, let me talk to you about salvation in verse 11, and let me talk to you something about something else in verse 12. It's not like he says, let me talk about verse 11, I'll end it with a period, let's move on to another thought. But it's more like he wants us to see that the salvation and grace of God that Jesus has brought to us, that this is what it looks like in real life. And as I will say it again, that it enables us to say no to the life we no longer want, and it enables us to say yes to the life that we truly want. And from last week, remember, we saw in verse 15 when he told Titus, oh, this this message, Titus, that I'm giving you now, I want you to declare these things. We saw that that was what is referred to as a present imperative, which means, Titus, preach this message. Don't stop preaching it. Don't let this just be a a once-a-year sermon on Christmas, Titus. Let this message that I am giving you be something that you continually teach. And there may be people that try to get in your way. There may, there may be people that, that, that don't like the message, but let nothing get in your way. That's what he meant by the words exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no one disregard you. Don't let anyone shove you to the side. It's, this message is too important for that, is what the Apostle Paul would say. So as we look at these two things, I I wanted to mention this a little bit earlier, but I want you to notice God's word is so amazing and so applicable to our lives and so relevant and so living and breathing, as Hebrew 4.12 says, and sometimes the word of God, in fact, maybe most times, the word of God is powerful For the words that it contains. In fact, it's always powerful for the words that it contains. But there are times that I believe the word of God is just as powerful for what it doesn't say. What it doesn't say. And as as we unfold this message, there is something that I have left out of the message by intention. There is something intentionally missing. And by the time we get to the end of this message, we're going to find out, number one, what is missing? What has not been mentioned so far? And number two, why is that so critical to what verse 12 is talking about? This message of enabling us to say no to the life we no longer want, that God's grace, God's salvation, what it looks like in real life, us saying no to ungodliness, and worldly passions. Here's why the message is so urgent then and so urgent today. This is why I believe that that we get to verse 15. Paul makes no mistake about it, and he says to Titus, declare these things, keep talking about them, don't let anybody get in your way, don't let anybody shove you to the side. In verse 16 of chapter 1, he describes some people that were present in, in the church at that time in, in fact, the city that, that Titus was, was an overseer in was known as Crete. He says that they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable. That's a pretty strong word, isn't it? In fact, when I read that, I was thinking, I don't know that I've ever used that word to describe anyone. I could be wrong, but I don't remember ever thinking, wow, that person is detestable. 
But he uses it here. They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Why this message was so important, apparently, is that there were those who believed in verse 11. They, they talked about the salvation of God coming. They talked about the grace of God appearing. But they didn't connect verse 12 with it. Now, I want you to circle the word training in verse 12 that it says that this grace that God has brought us, this salvation that God has brought us through Jesus Christ, that that it is training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. It's the grace of God training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Now, I was surprised at what I found this week in my studies. In fact, in the Bible, because training can look differently, right? Right? I mean, like, like if, if you were to observe a soldier who is training for the battlefield, would that look different than a toddler who is potty training? That'd look a little different, wouldn't it? And in the Bible, interestingly enough, the Apostle Paul uses the world of athletics and he uses the world of military to speak about how we're to train. For example, he says uh, to, to Timothy, you know, to, to train yourself for godliness. And he talks about, to Timothy again, be a good soldier like Jesus Christ. So Paul, what is he doing in there? He's using military language to describe and, and, and encourage Timothy. Also, we see in the scriptures, I'm thinking 1 Corinthians 9 primarily, there are athletic metaphors used. In fact, when Paul talks about his own walk of renouncing ungodliness and worldly passions and moving on with Jesus, he, 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 he de- de- describes himself as a boxer who isn't beating the air. He says, I, he says, I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. So again, he's pulling from the world of athletics. So I thought to myself, well, surely the grace of God that is described in here when it tells us that, it's, that, that it trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, surely it would have this either military metaphor like, come on, soldier, you're in basic training, renounce ungodliness, renounce worldly passions, live solely for Jesus, or it would pull from the world of athletics. You know, you've got a race to run. Run the race well. But I was so surprised when I looked up this world in the original language, and it was a word that only described the training and education of children. In fact, the Greek word for child is contained in this verb. And I thought, well, that's not what I expected. I mean, I thought, you know, basic training, military style, or, or athletics, you know, go for the gold kind of language. Why in the world would he use a word when speaking to adults, a training that was applied exclusively to children? And then I thought, well, Jesus did say, right, that that in order to inherit the kingdom of God, what? That you must become like a child. But then also I thought about, first of all, in the training of children, in the instruction of children, children in the ancient world, first of all, only those who were upper class went to school. In fact, in Greek culture, it was only little boys that went to school from about the age of seven on. And there were two primary ways that a little boy in Greek culture would be educated, two ways that this little boy would be trained. And I believe the second one that I want to mention is what Paul may have in mind here. The first way they were trained would be very similar to what we used to know as far as school goes, where these little boys, maybe up to 20, would trek their way to a building, and there would be a solo instructor that would train them in in gymnastics and exercise and rhetoric and all the other things that were important to Greeks. A more common way, perhaps, was that because only the upper class could afford to go to school, what that little boy would be given from the time that he 
was educated would be a one-on-one tutor. That it would be the job of this tutor who would stay close to this little boy, who would, who would lovingly uh, correct him, who would train him step by step by step by step. When I thought about that, I thought, you know, when Jesus said that I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And in fact, not only am I going to give you the Holy Spirit, it is better that I go away so that I can leave the Holy Spirit with you. And he will teach you. You see, we have been given that tutor. We have been given that one. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It is not just a force. It is not an impersonal thing. The Holy Spirit has been given to us by Jesus to lead us into righteousness and to lead us into verse 12 of renouncing ungodliness and worldly passions, or in other words, saying no to the life we no longer want. Now, the question here this morning is not a question of perfection. Because we could all line up and there's not a single one of us in this place or listening that would say, you know what, when it comes to verse 12, I got it down, baby. I mean, I no longer struggle with, with any, any passions that would be considered worldly. In fact, I think about God all day, man. None of us can say that, can we? In fact, I read a fascinating article, actually uh, an article in a book, and the article stated that there are about 125 sins that are listed in the Bible. And the article went on to say that all 125 sins that are listed in the Bible could be listed under one of the Ten Commandments. And I found that article kind of fascinating. But you know what the good news is of that? Did you know that most of, the, most of those 125 sins, you didn't do this week? Neither did I. You know, witchcraft is defined as a sin in the Bible. Were any of you tempted to do witchcraft this week? Chances are you were not. So the, most of the sins, in fact, one author said, Bruce Wilkinson, in his book, Overcoming Temptation, says that most people that want to live a godly life, most people that follow Christ, can probably narrow it down to one hand of the, of the things that they wrestle with, of the things that they are needing God's grace for when it comes to sin. So the question here is not one of perfection. Have we nailed this down? to where we no longer need training. The question is not a question of perfection. It's a question of direction. And the direction question is, am I walking in the direction of verse 12 where I am depending on the Holy Spirit, the one that Jesus said would be my teacher, the one that Jesus said would lead me into righteousness, Am I moving in that direction? Because really, the, when it comes down to it, God's gift enables us to say no to the life we no longer want. We don't want that. That leads no, to nothing but, but guilt and condemnation and, and frustration. Secondly, God's gift enables us to say yes to the life that we truly want. That it trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions... And it trains us, Holy Spirit tutor, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. And those last three qualities, self-controlled, upright, and godly lives, that is something that every one of us desire. In fact, when it, when it speaks about this, this is not like a commandment somewhere out there that we try to bring inside of us. If we know Jesus, this is where our heart is. Our heart is that, you know what, I may not be perfect in self-control, but I want to move towards that. I may not be perfect in being upright, but I want my life to grow in that direction. 
My life may, you know, not be uh, godliness every moment of the day, but, it, but that's where my heart is. Because these are the things that will give us that internal peace and lack of guilt, that example of Christ to others. Now, I want to read Galatians chapter 5. I think Galatians, what Paul does in Galatians is he unpacks verse 12. And it is this longer text and the one in Titus that I want you to see because there's something so critical that is missing. He says these words to the church in Galatia. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's the training, the Holy Spirit training. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So he's talking about that battle that we've all experienced, wanting to do the right thing, saying we're going to do the right thing, but sometimes failing. But if you were led by the Spirit, you were not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, I said that that this text is powerful for what it says, and it's powerful for what it does not say. Did you notice that missing from the text, he says, walk in the Spirit, And then he describes what that looks like. He describes what looking in the flesh looks like. And then he summarizes by bringing a closing statement that's kind of related to the first one. Not one time does he give us how to. Did you notice that? He says walk in the spirit, but he doesn't say how to walk in the spirit. He doesn't say, hey, Christians, if you want to walk in the spirit... Wake up early, spend the first 15 minutes of your day praying, the second 15 minutes reading the Bible, third, you know, quoting scripture, whatever. He doesn't give a how-to. He doesn't give seven steps to follow to walk in the Spirit. He doesn't say, hey, here are four principles that if you follow these, you will be walking in the Spirit and never give into the flesh. And it's important Because of the why not. I mean, if we're to walk in the Spirit, if we're to keep in step with the Spirit, if we're to not do these things and do these things, it's almost like we're crying out, hey, give me some help here. Give me some steps to do. Give me some principles to follow. And the reason that it's missing from the text is that if we were to take those principles, take those steps, take those how-tos, we would invariably turn it in to another law that we would not be able to follow in the first place. You remember the very first, the very first principle given in the Bible. One step was given. One principle was given. One how-to. Stay away from the tree. That's it. All these other trees you can freely eat from. Hang out with the animals. I've given you your own personal zoo. Eat from all these trees. There's one tree. Don't eat of it. God leaves them alone. The next thing, hey, where are you going? I'm going to go check out that tree we're not supposed to. See, and the reason for that is this is not a how-to. This is a walk with Jesus intimately. 
This is a holy, the Holy Spirit is your teacher. He will teach you. He will tutor you. He will instruct you. And this is a relationship, not a law. And the reason for that is that all relationships are different. What works for one will not work for another. You know, I, am, I have been a very, very blessed man and have been given four children. And I know from having four children that are, you know, now and all of them in their 20s and adults and on their own, I know that they were different from one another. And what worked for this child didn't work for that child. Isn't it amazing that as a child of God, God knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly what you need. You could take two believers, two children of God that deal with a particular sin. Let's use, let's use uh, he talks about kind of anger out of control. I think he uses the word fits of, fits, fits of anger. The Holy Spirit may lead person A this way to get victory over that sin and lead person B in a different way. But see, what what happens if person A says, hey, this is what I did, and God gave me victory over sin, and this is what you have to do. All of a sudden, that beautiful tutoring, if you will, by the Spirit has now become a law for that other person. Does that make sense? All this is saying is, is, is that to get there, It's not a law, it's loving Jesus. That the salvation and grace of God has appeared. And it's this moment by moment, day by day, falling in love with Jesus to get us to the goal that he wants us to get to. What we are given instead of principles and steps to follow is the picture of an intimate relationship with Christ in verse 25. Notice that while he does not give us how-tos and do this first, this second, this third, he says, first of all, but I say walk by the Spirit, sort of this broad principle, but then look how he closes this in verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That is language for a beautiful Day by day, moment by moment, walking with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? I want to give us an opportunity just to kind of take everything we've heard and just to have a conversation with Jesus in a moment of silence. And then I will pray and break that silence. with a prayer and then an Advent blessing. Father, as we come to you this morning, I I feel the need to ask your forgiveness, Lord. There have been so many times in my life when I've looked at areas of my life that that I need to grow in godliness and be more godly in. And Lord, I've looked to principles and uh, the advice of, of others more than I've looked to that intimate relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that you've called us to live by the Spirit and walk and keep in step with the Spirit. Lead us to do that. Show us the way. Thank you that you, just as you 
walked with two disciples on the road of Emmaus, that through your spirit you walk with every one of us and you walk with us as a church. And may we hear what the spirit is saying to us through this message. And now may we be filled with the wonder of God's indescribable gift that enables us to say no to the life of bondage to sin and self and yes to the life we truly want. And may we, like Simeon of old, behold Jesus who is our salvation. In his name we pray. Amen. And at this moment, I am reminded that I completely forgot to set out the communion elements. So um, let's partake of that next week. See, that's known as a cliffhanger. We're like, wow, I got to get back for communion. Let's uh, stand before the Lord. I love you. Thank you so much for being here and listening in and worshiping virtually or in person. Let's pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great week. Love you.